Well, hello again, everybody. Right, this time I'm going to read to you from chapter 46 of my new book, which came out December 14th, 2022. Out of the Bottomless Pit 2. And this is from chapter 46. And it's called Chimeras. Well, well what is a chimera? A chimera is just basically when somebody's messed about with the DNA of people or animals, mix them together. Sound familiar? I think that's what they're doing today in transhumanism. Well, it was thought of all the way back there before the Great Flood by the fallen angels. And they would alter the DNA of animals, mix them together for whatever purposes. And they mix the DNA of humans and animals together for different purposes. So you ended up having all kinds of strange looking creatures walking around and God had to destroy them in the Great Flood. Well you can see some examples of that clearly in the stories of Chronicles of Narnia and even in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. You can see some of these chimeras. Where did they get those ideas from? You'll find them in the book of Enoch. You'll find them in all the, the six world empires have been, they've had these chimeras for their kingdoms or their symbols. Why is that? Where do they get the idea from? Huh? I'd say they got it from the fallen angels. Anyway, chimeras. Why did God, in speaking to his prophets, choose to use chimeras as an illustration of future world empires? For example, in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, mysterious hybrid or chimera creatures are mentioned. Also mythological creatures, such as seven-headed dragon in Revelation 12. See chapter 17, Dragons and Dinosaurs, in my book, Out of the Bottomless Pit, the first book. Why did the ancient Babylonians, as well as Egyptians, Assyrians, Greeks and Romans, all mention giants, chimeras, and other strange creatures such as trolls? Why do we find richly fixed in nearly every culture on earth all kinds of legends of small creatures as well as giants. From leprechauns in the Emerald Isle of Ireland to the trolls of Scandinavia. Yes. Everywhere one looks there is so much evidence that all the above have been seen by human beings and even in very recent times under special circumstances. If evolution were true, then none of these creatures should in fact be possible because of God's evolution and so-called survival of the fittest, these strange aberrations of nature would not have survived birth. And yet apparently they did survive very well. Why? How did they come into being? God's strange creatures in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4 we see described four very strange beasts. Each beast has four heads. And they are known as the cherubim, around the throne of God himself, which also mentioned in other places in the Bible upon occasion. And God was visiting his prophets, such as in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1 and 10, and in the book of Isaiah. Well, the cherubim have four heads in total. One head is a lion, one is a calf, one is a man, or angel, one as eagle. Their arms and legs are as those of a man. Very strange creature. Every one of the cherubim also had six wings about them. Well, it's interesting in Revelation 4, it mentions four wings to these four beasts. And in Ezekiel 1 and 10, it mentions six, which is right. Maybe one of the prophets just happened to see things on a certain angle, only saw four wings, and the other one saw six, saw from a different angle. Who knows? Just as so-called science largely denies the existence of giants and simply brushes off all the evidence it finds under the carpet, actually literally, that's what they do. They find skeletons of giants, they bury them, they get rid of them, because it goes against their paradigm of evolution, which they're trying to use to control people in unbelief, anything but believe in God or Jesus. So... It literally, they do find the evidence of giants and other creatures, simply brush it under the carpet, bury it. That's their policy. Well, Romans 1, 
Hebrews 11. Same is true with mysterious creatures and mythology, which might in some cases have a basis in factual evidence, which again has been conveniently brushed aside under the carpet of evolutionary teaching that such things have never happened and it couldn't possibly happen. I think it's terrible that people can live their lives, their lives on lies and think it's okay. In my Bible it states that every man's going to have to give an account of every idle word, never mind every lie and every bad deed and every evil. They're going to have to give account of every idle word. And those wealthy and powerful who elite who rule the planet and and treat people with such disdain and such um, arrogance and trample on the poor. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes for anything. If you have to give account for every idle word, never mind your evil deeds, you're going to be in the right fix. So anyway, when it comes to, one of the interesting about the paranormal is the fact that so many of these governments and powers, they try to brush it all under the carpet and pretend it's not happening. You see, because they don't like things they can't control, things they can't explain. They don't like it, like with UFOs. What they do with UFOs, most times just pretend it never happened and just tell the public, nah, you just saw it, it's, it's, it's you hallucinating. Eh? So with a lot of paranormal things, the, the powers that be don't want people to know it's real. <clears throat> There's all kind of reasons for that as well. I won't get into that side of things now, but uh, it's interesting. Well... Wow. Okay, however, the false doctrine of evolution cannot explain the many mystery, mysterious sightings of amazing creatures by so many people all through time as documented by most cultures on earth at some time or other. Sadly, most of the time, if anyone is brave enough to even suggest that some of these creatures of mythology were probably real, they'll be hooted down as a nut job or delusional by the so-called scientific community, which is not actually very scientific at all. And they refuse. Science is from Latin, it's supposed to mean I know something. But they don't know, they pretend to know. And they act as though they know, and everybody else is an idiot who doesn't believe everything they say. That's how it is, that's how they do it, because of money, because of power, and because of the paradigm to control the masses in unbelief in God like says in Romans 1. As they refuse to see the evidence, even when it's right in front of them, just because it's outside of the evolutionary paradigm. Oh, well, they've got lots of paradigms now. Another one is global warming. They've got loads of their paradigms, which are totally lies, and no evidence them at all. But they're all control mechanisms that make lots of money for the rich and the elite. Loads of money. Billions. Origin of both the giants and the chimeras. Is it just possible or well, we can find the answers right there in the Bible itself? Genesis chapter 6 is probably the best key to understanding how it all started. Also, it's a good idea to be somewhat familiar with the non-canonical books such as, and especially, the book of Enoch. Yeah, read my book, Enoch Insights. Book of Jasher. Read my books, Jasher Insights, book 1 and 2. Book of Jubilees, read my book, Jubilees Insights. They all agree with the Bible and sometimes give many more details concerning the same stories. It's true. All of them talk about giants and chimeras. It's true, they do. If the giants and the chimeras came into being before the Great Flood, what about after the Great Flood? Did the same conditions happen again, i.e. Genesis 6 mating of the angels were the women on earth to create giants and the supernatural abilities of the fallen angels enable them to tamper with the genetics of animals and birds and fish to form chimeras. The following from the book of Joshua, chapter 80, is about the ten plagues of Egypt and the deliverance of the children of Israel from the hand of Moses. The subject chimeras are in the 13th to 16th verses. <clears throat> Jasher 80, 13 to 16. And the Lord sent all kind of beasts of the field into Egypt. And it came and destroyed all Egypt, man and beasts and trees and all things in Egypt. And the Lord sent fiery serpents, scorpions, 
whole things in Egypt. Mice, weasels, toads together, with other creeping things in the dust. Flies, hornets, etc., etc. Swarms and all reptiles, winged animals. Look at that. Winged animals. What's a winged animal? Well, something like a dragon or something, or some chimera. And according to their kind, they came into Egypt and grieved the Egyptians exceedingly. <clears throat> if that wasn't strange enough, when we get down to the 19th verse, we read the following very strange account. Yeah, you can read this in my book, Jash Insights. And when the Egyptians hid themselves on account of the swarm of animals, they looked, they locked their doors after them. It's very odd. And God ordered the Sulanuth, which is in the sea, to come up and go into Egypt. And she had long arms, 10 cubits in length. That's like at least 15, 20 feet long, each arm. Length the cubits of a man. Okay. So each, or well, even longer than that, and each of her arms are around 20, 25 feet long. She was apparently some sort of octopus-like creature or a smaller kraken, a small kraken. The next verse is almost impossible for modern man to even conceive. And the sooner they went up upon the roofs and uncovered the rafting and the flooring and cut them and stretched forth the arm into the house and removed the lock and the bolt open the houses of Egypt. And afterwards came the swarm of animals and the, into the houses of Egypt, swarms of animals and destroyed the Egyptians and it grieved them exceedingly. There are many more interesting things happening in the 80th chapter of Jasher, which I highly recommend everybody to read. Yeah, get my book Jasher Insights, book two in that case. For those who would naturally just dismiss the above account as a mere story or myth, I'd like to remind everybody the story of Jonah in the Bible, which also sounds totally impossible to our modern logic. Imagine a man being swallowed by a very large fish of some kind, spending three days in its belly and being still alive. After desperate prayer, God had ordered the fish to vomit the prophet Jonah out onto dry land in the direction of Nineveh, the very city that God told Jonah to preach to. Yes. Well, that's a fantastic story that I won't get into now. That's in more of this chapter. Wow. Remember, the Bible says that with God, nothing is impossible. Luke one thirty seven. We just have to have faith in the living God, and he can do absolutely anything if it suits his purpose. Hebrews 11.6. Okay, well, I think that pretty much wraps it up. So I think oh well, yeah, I'll just finish off this story here. It says here, imagine a man being swallowed by a very large fish of some kind, spending three days in its belly. Jonah, everybody knows the story, Jonah. Jonah had originally refused and tried to run away from God by taking a ship to Tarshish. So it says southern Spain, others say it was Britain, across the Mediterranean Sea. Huge storm had arisen, and the sailors, being afraid, asked all men on board if any of them had committed a crime against any god. And Jonah told them the storm had come because he had run away from obeying his god. So in fear, the sailors reluctantly threw Jonah, on his own insistence, into the sea, which immediately went completely calm. A very large fish appeared alongside the ship and swallowed Jonah up whole. Amazing story, isn't this? It's fantastic. I have to read this, the book of Jonah. If God could cause a big fish to swallow up Jonah the prophet and cause him to be vomited back onto dry land three days later so that Jonah could repent and go on to do what God had originally commanded to do, I warned in of impending doom, then why can't couldn't God do the strange things as mentioned in the book of Jasher? Again, you'll see my book Jasher Insights. And the Bible says, like I said before, that with God nothing is impossible. That's true. Luke 137. We just have to have faith in the living God and that he will do absolutely anything if it suits his purpose. And I can testify to that many times. That's true. There's nothing God can't do for his children, those who obey him. Hebrews 11.6. 
So that's the end of that short chapter. I hope you found that interesting. And I would encourage everybody, please to buy my ninth book, which just came out last month, Out of the Bottom's Pit, Part 2. You'll find a very exciting book because it's chock-a-block full of very interesting paranormal experiences, um, spiritual experiences, personal ones, personal encounters with the paranormal, supernatural encounters, uh, stories of ghosts, story of what the military's been up to and what they're doing in delving into paranormal and stuff. Well, they know about it. They know it's there. They don't understand it, but they delve in it. They try to use it. So anyway, please do find my book, Out of Bit 2. I think you'll find it very interesting. You can get it on Amazon as a paper book, or you can get it on Kindle. Or you can even buy it directly from me. If you buy it from me, you'll get a big discount this January. If Amazon's selling it, you look it up, so it's $20 on Amazon. Well, I'm selling it for just £15. It's quite a bit cheaper. Plus postage, of course. But if you want a whole bunch of the books, just contact me, Steve, at Stephen with a PH, Stephen dot strut at btinternet.com. And I can make a way so you can get the books. And I was, like I said, some people, most people I'd say, tend to buy three, four, six, or eight books. Now there are nine books to consider. But if you buy them from me, I won't charge you more than 15 pounds a book. I won't charge more than that was. You'll find the UK is selling for 21 pounds and the States is selling them for at least $20 or more. $25. I think it's outrageous they jack up the prices. It's not me that decides the prices. If me, I put it half the price they got. But if you'd like to help our effort to get these, these insights books out to as many people as possible around the world, then please do buy the books. And if you happen to buy them from Amazon, please, once you've read them, if you like them, and you really find them interesting, Please take the time to put a five star rating on Amazon so that more people can know about the books and the books can get out to a much bigger audience. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.